Good day, viewers. This is once again your Kalusugan Ay Karapatan program. I'm Lilian de las Liagas, and I have with me my co-host, the Chancellor of UP Manila, Dr. Carmen Sita Padilla. Hi, Manchit. Thank you, Dr. Lili. Good day to our viewers as well. Today, we're going to talk about Republic Act 11036, or the Philippine Mental Health Act, has been signed into law on 20 of June 2018 and is now part of the Philippine General Healthcare System. What does this mean? This means help and support to those with mental problems are accessible. And one of the outstanding provisions of this act is that medical and psychotherapeutic services will be made available to the lowest unit, which is the barangay. It will be made available in municipalities, cities, and provinces. The law mandates that local government units of or LGUs to allocate funds for the mental health programs and services. This includes the establishment of facilities to deliver services up to the tertiary hospitals in cities and municipalities. Chancellor, being involved in health concerns, it seems like we know something about the mental health problem. But I think we can deeper, deepen our viewers' knowledge about mental health if we ask help from the experts. Yes, Dr. Lili, let us expose, let us now start a discussion on uh, the Mental Health Act and uh, allow me to introduce our guest uh, who will enlighten us on this particular law. Our first resource speaker is a professor emeritus of the University of the Philippines, Manila, who obtained her Doctor of Medicine degree from UP and later subspecialized in community and social psychiatry at the State University of New York, Syracuse, New York. She was the chief investigator for the Philippines in the WHO collaborative study undertaken in seven developing countries on strategies for extending mental health care. She has worked as World Health Organization consultant on mental health in many Asian countries like Mongolia, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, and many others. She received the 2014 Lifetime Asia Achievement Award from the Asian Federation of Psychiatric Associations in Kuala Lumpur, a first in the history of the Philippine Psychiatric Association in which one of its highly esteemed members is among the ranks of the most decorated psychiatrists in Asia. She has devoted much of herself in working towards the betterment of mental health service in our country as well as other Asian nations. She is currently a member of the Philippine Council for Mental Health, the policy making and coordinating body for the implementation of the recently passed mental health law. The chair of the council is the Secretary of Health. I understand that the CHED is also represented here by our very own Commissioner Lilian de las Liagas. So ladies and gentlemen, may I present Dr. Lourdes Lulu Ignacio. Our second resource person has a specialization in neurology and epileptology. She was the president of the Philippine League Against Epilepsy. She has spent the last 25 years not only in clinical practice, but also as an educator, leader, researcher, and advocate of continuing health education. She received an award as one of the 2008 Outstanding Filipino Physicians. She's currently professor in chair, Department of Neurosciences, UPPGH, Medical Center. She was recently appointed as a member of the Philippine Council of Mental Health representing academe and research. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Leonor Cabral Lim. Dr. Leonor? Uh, good, good, good afternoon, dear viewers. We're very happy to be here to share our uh, knowledge on the mental, recently enacted mental health law. So let us start asking our resource uh, speakers today on uh, the pertinent provisions of the Mental Health Act. Can we start with, uh, with Dr. Ignacio, Dr. Yeah. Lulu? Thank you very much. Uh, this is a long-awaited Mental Health Act. We've worked on it in the last two decades, I guess. 
and we look at this as really coming up with the reforms in our mental health system because it provides for a comprehensive, integrated, effective, accessible mental health services down the grassroots of our country. Because traditionally, people think, tend to think that mental health care can only be availed of in hospitals and in clinics. Now the law is strong in, in providing for the system that will really bring mental health care to the grassroots. It has even a specific provision for the training of barangay health workers in mental health care, which is close to my heart because this is really where my own work um, in the university and in the NGO which I represent is, con is um, concentrated on. And the law, of course, in providing these accessible services really upholds the right of every Filipino to accessibility of much needed mental health care, which has long been neglected. We still see a lot of people suffering from mental health problems that are remaining chronic, disabled, untreated, dehumanized yeah, in their particular state. And many of you who probably be listening to us would know that there is no community where this group of patients are really abandoned uh, walking the streets, your town grasa, for example, even in the cities where we have already some services and families suffering from the stigma and discrimination that the illness suffers from. The law will be strong and we hope we really could get the necessary government and non-government support to get this implemented. This has been worked out in its own implementing rules and regulations and uh, Dr. Lim and Dr. Liaga, De La Liagas here and I who are members of the council will just do our best to really get this whole thing going. Um, the law also provides that not only uh, should we take care and provide the necessary services, we also must address the needs to promote the mental health and well-being of the greater number of the population. If you're talking about 110 million Filipinos, at least only 20% are affected by the mental disorders that we, the specialists, would probably address ourselves. The 80% are the well. The people who are going the streets, you and I are working in our respective jobs, but are affected by various traces of daily life. They're affected by difficulties in our family structures, affected by overseas workers leaving children behind and therefore disrupting families. We're talking about the greater number of our people because we are disaster-prone country affected by disasters. They may be suffering from what so-called are the mental health problems but are not really taken as sick or as ill, but as really affected by the adversity of life called stresses that must be addressed. So that's the other portion of the population where we need to have promotions for mental health programs, address the vulnerable in the disaster prone areas, and provide emergency care when such stresses happen. So the whole law will be addressing that it's formidable, but I think it's workable. Okay, so I just have uh, two follow-up questions. When you say comprehensive, I mean, you talked about mental disorders, but can, can you give us a, a list of what's covered by uh, the conditions when we say under the Mental Health Care, or Care, Care Act? Well, uh, mental disorders in the Mental Health Care Act is interestingly enough, including the neurology disorders now, and that also will show you where the science is, is expanding. We, we talk about those you traditionally know have mental problems. You, know, you would not forget that depression, psychosis, all those that fall under the specific classification of disorders for mental disorders. But a greater number, and that because I've worked very much also on disaster mental health, 
a greater number of the people we provide services to now, especially in the areas that have long been, that have been affected by disorder at what we call the psychosocial problems. We, we name this because we do not look at them as sick right away. We look at them as vulnerable, if not taken care of. Vulnerable for depression, vulnerable for psychosis, vulnerable for the illnesses, anxiety, if not taken care of. So that psychosocial problems are in the big category of the people affected by extreme life experiences, disasters, victims of domestic violence, victims of child abuse, and so you get to the children part. Victims of community violence, victims of armed conflict, there are a lot there, and our newspapers cannot spare us from being aware of this. And we do need to address those issues, and that's in the mental health field. That's, in fact, the growing concern of the mental health condition in the last two decades, and the law has also articulated that we have to address those. The other group is Dr. Cabral Slim's specialty. Now we're marrying psychiatry and neurology because we like to say that when you do have mental disorders, it's not just a problem of a problem there. You lost your husband, you lost your job, a problema. It really is a conglomerate of several factors, biologic factors as well as social factors. There is something in your body that also makes you vulnerable for depression. Dr. Padilla's line of genetics get into our interest. That's in the field of neuroscience because environment affects gene expressions and therefore can really be looked at as it's not just genetic predisposition, it's also environmentally predisposed. So the whole range of, of the mental health law in the Philippines is unique. It's the only law that carries these three conditions to address. The mental disorders, the psychosocial problems, and the neurologic disorders. Other countries will only address the mental disorders. Okay. So we, which shifts now to Dr. Yonor. Can you tell us about the component, the neurologic uh, disorders covered by the mental care, health care? Actually, I, I am very happy that uh, Dr. Ignacio mentioned about the marriage. No? Because we started courting each other when we joined in late 2015. And we're, I always tell this during the meetings. We're very happy that uh, psychiatry welcomed us to, uh, in the, uh, when we were working on having the bill passed and even working in the, all the meetings with this. So uh, I'm very happy to note that, like doc what Doctora said, this is the only mental health law globally that includes neurologic uh, services. And uh, uh, it follows, the, adapts the framework of the WHO looking at these conditions under the MNS uh, acronym meaning mental, neurologic, and substance abuse. And the priority conditions that are identified for mental health for the psychiatric are uh, depression, um, psychosis, uh, self-harm and suicide for the neurologic is epilepsy, uh, uh, mental and behavioral disorders mm -hmm. in children, dementia, and substance abuse. No? So, of course, there's a lot of um, neurologic disorders. In fact, since the mental health law defines, we did not define mental illness. We defined it as mental health condition. And it is stated there that the mental health conditions include neurologic and psychiatric disorders, which in, so that we cannot, we will not go on amending as the science progresses. It is defined there that the definition will depend on the evidence that is going to be available that is current. So I believe because this is really formidable that the, 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 as far as the services is concerned, uh, most likely we will start with the priority conditions who are actually in the MHGAP program because these are the ones that are highly st stigmatizing. These are the ones that have a high socioeconomic burden and these are the ones that are associated with the social determinants of health. So actually, if you look at it, the definition of mental health in the bill is, in the Filipino version, is more encompassing in the sense that it does not only include that they are able to cope with the uh, stresses of life, 
It even include the, includes there that you should be resilient to adversities, keeping in, in mind that we are prone to disasters. And also it includes in the, in the uh, contribution to society that you have a, to have a positive contribution to society, not just a contribution to society. I, I was just interested because, you know, you mentioned no? uh, mental, neurologic, and substance abuse. So substance abuse actually is uh, covered the, in the spectrum of conditions. So can you just give the viewers an example where it, uh, that's included in uh, the provision? Uh, of the substance law? abuse includes alcohol abuse, nicotine abuse, uh, drug abuse. No? So actually, even before the bill was passed, there was already a DOH uh, administrative order that expanded the components of the National Mental Health Program. And that's Doctora mentioned, the components are wellness, and then the other one is uh, resiliency, you know, disasters, and then we have the psychiatric, neurologic, and then substance abuse. It's already in the National Mental Health Program of the Department of Health. So actually anything that is contrary to mental health is contrary to government and the bill. <laughs> Okay. okay. <laughs> it just gives you some, some view now that it's everybody's business. Because we are not only going to be there not abnegating our own specialization. We have to take care of the mental disorders. But we have to help other sectors of society who are there in the whole arena of taking care of the people, the population, promote mental health your area in education is very crucial to this from because the mental health law gives you also the view that every provision must have a life course perspective. So it's from womb to tomb. Yes, womb to tomb. So, Dr. Ras, um, Chancellor mentioned, the law is uh, available. Yes. We need to give our viewers uh, an opportunity to know how big this problem is, the mental health conditions. Is, uh, is there a statistics that would tell us how big this problem is in the Philippines? Um, the, the, that's the other unfortunate thing because the, the uh, statistical the study on prevalence is ongoing. That's UPPGH. On Friday, we're finalizing from my organization, the World Association for Psychosocial Rehabilitation, we're finalizing the PCHRD sponsored, defining the research agenda on mental health in the Philippines, where really um, information systems, the prevalence, the way by which recording of that are going to be taken care of, um, are going to be put in place. So I will not yet answer what, what is the extent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you do really see the fact that you will not need a figure when you know that out in the streets you'll find 10 people uh, dehumanized, untreated, tied to the lamppost because they're mentally sick and their families abandon them. Or if you see the overcrowding in mental hospitals at this point in time, and you will not know how many of these who are not hospitalized are also that sick yet, you know. Um, you will know that the problem is really great from the mental disorders point of view. But I think everybody in the country is aware that there are so many stories about young students jumping off uh, quite unusual for these are of the higher income class, you know, this kind of thing. And we know what in PGH, we have a regular row of overseas workers coming in, broken down, you know, in, in severe mental disorders. We, I, my feel as a clinical person and as a human being, I would not need the figures anymore to know that we should really come up with accessible care for this people. Yeah, the, the uh, statistics would provide an estimate of how much we need such that the universal health care can really allocate certain amount 
to make sure that the uh, mental health law is going to be accessible from the level of tertiary to the level of barangay. So, of course, statistics perhaps would be available in terms of UP Manila PGH uh, classification of mental health problems, which would comprise what is the spectrum of the psychiatric uh, mental health disorders from the point of view of PGH. The PGH study is a national study. Yes, it's a, a PCH or DDOH commission study. It's ongoing at the moment, you know, and that's with our clinical epidemiology group also. If we go back to past figures, yes, no. past yeah. that I will be comfortable. Yes, yes. The study in WHO as looking into how many persons ordinarily consulting a health center, our study area was in Sampaloc, Balik Balik area. How many persons would have a mental health problem who would not go there for a mental health problem, but will go there for family planning, tuberculosis, follow-up dots, uh, uh, blood pressure, etc., etc. The figure came up to be 20% of people ordinarily consulting that health center would have a mental health problem. Oh, oh, that 40 percent of those were diagnosed to be in depression. 48 percent of those were in anxiety disorders collected to the chronic tuberculosis, the, the stroke problem that they would ordinarily go to the health center, or mothers and mothers who would be subject to domestic violence in the home, but coming with mental health problem, but not really saying I'm depressed, but saying I can't stand being having to have babies anymore, you know, this kind of thing. So you'll know that the mental health problem is already there in the, in the situation among those in so the health So it's embedded. Centers. Yes. Yes, that's why yes. we are advocating that in health centers, mental health care must be part of the whole general health service. So let me follow up. This is very interesting in the context of public view about the severity of this major public health problem in the Philippines, Dr. Dr. Leonor and Dr. Uh, Lulu, is there such a thing as uh, education-based program to detect, for example, in uh, schools, erratic behavior of pupils? Is there such a thing as uh, school-based uh, mental health prevention promotion program. There's a mental health week, isn't it? A um, long time ago. At least in the health center, we have such a thing as a self-report questionnaire that a midwife or a nurse could give an ordinary consultee so we would be able to detect the mental health problem. I think the screening instruments in schools is still something that yeah. we have to work out that, That's a... Uh, you know. Yeah. Because up, like practically for neurology, yes. there's really nothing in place, no, except like in in our volunteer organization where we have the epilepsy caravan, where we educate the school children about epilepsy. Yeah. But this is a volunteer tie up with DepEd. It's not an official. That's why we're very happy that uh, since there is a law now that all the NGOs, academia, and everybody can work together, look at what we already have so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Doctor, that's uh, very interesting. We are looking at it as a psycho psychosocial uh, cultural health problem in the Philippines. And we have the readiness already to face this. Mm -hmm. I, I think what I'm seeing is that whereas in the past when you talk about mental you're always looking at the end of the spectrum. No? Mm -hmm. You're talking about a patient who will go to a psychiatric hospital or a mental, mm -hmm. mental hospital. What I'm hearing now is that it really, it really ranges anywhere from just a psychosocial event, mm -hmm. you know, a response to trauma, to something more severe. Or it can be, uh, as you said, you know, um, part of the neurologic condition. And uh, I just want to follow uh, up your, your comment, uh, Dr. Lili, that Yes, you know, the schools probably will have a big role because you want to catch the children a, a, a little bit earlier. From home and, to uh, <laughs> And uh, actually, uh, fortunately in UP Manila for the past several years, we 
with the help of the Department of Psychiatry, we actually implemented mm. a very simple we're screening this model already. We, we yeah. actually have, and we're picking up some of the students much earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, surprisingly, we really have students who need help. They're not really, they're not yet really at the end of the spectrum, but they can be picked up early. So, with the law, I am hoping that this is something that we can introduce even much earlier because actually college is too late already. Yes. We will have to do it much earlier because of the stresses around, around us. Um, I, I, I want to, um, you know, we just had the, we just discussed universal health care yes. and I thought that, you know, we can ask uh, our resource speakers now to talk about how does it integrate now with the <laughs> universal health care law. <laughs> you know, your law was uh, uh, signed earlier, but uh, the goal now is in to integrate both. So I'll start with Dr. Leonor on uh, how, how can we integrate uh, the Actually, two. in all the, because I've been attending all the stakeholders meeting and all the, the other meetings with the Department of Health, no? And at, I'm very happy to note that the Department of Health is saying we will integrate this in the entire uh, healthcare system. Meaning for the child, it will be, there will be an integration with child care even the immunization programs are important to prevent these conditions like epilepsy and developmental disorders. And then um, what we want is we want all these conditions to be recognized at the primary care. We want to capacitate the primary care that if you go to a primary care, care center, they can take care of you. And then the, the small percentage, at least for neurologic, which would be 20 to 30 percent that are difficult to treat, are the ones who's going to be referred to the specialist. But this will need a lot of capacity building and reorientation because right now, before uh, you ask the primary care physicians, they will tell you, we don't want to touch neurologic conditions. That is for the neurologist. And uh, at the start, yeah, there was a fear among there were, there were people who voiced out that they were criticizing us, thinking that we wanted this bill because we wanted to be the ones to be out there treating these conditions. And we're saying, no way. We're even saying, we are going to teach you how to take care of them because you don't, they don't have to come to us. So there's really no intention for the specialists to do that. No? The intention really is to bright, provide equity for all for these conditions that we are committed to serve. Okay, what about uh, Dr. Lulu? Well, uh, I've been into primary health care work in the last 20 years and really just got me convinced that we should be there. You know, of course, we use our other resources than, than government, but I think if we have to address the whole population, this is the biggest challenge. We have to convince uh, not only our leaders, our policy makers, but the, the people providing care down the field, that mental health is part of the general definition of health. If you are going to say, I'm going to be healthy, I should not be healthy only because my blood pressure is okay, my body is okay. I should also say I'm healthy because I can think clearly, my emotions are stable, I just don't blurt out at any one time or conk anybody on the head or that I am healthy because my relationships are okay and stable. That's one of the things that we have to push, and I'm saying this for a general public information education, because you are body and mind. I mean, you know, tell me if you have any problem at all that you'll just have loose bowel movement and not worry, you do. And that's a mental health issue. So. On top of that, therefore, the general public may feel that way, but our own doctors in the field at the moment, and this is, again, a, a de de defect of our own medical education, nursing education. We have been very biomedical. We have been very concentrated on the body. It's taking us, the psychiatrists, the neurologists, time to even get curricular hours for putting that in a medical school curriculum, talking of curriculum, but we're getting there because the law is now giving that push a little bit. But if we go out there and show the municipal health officer, the rural health officer, the rural health midwife, the rural health nurse, 
that it is not all of psychiatry, it is not all of neurology, it's really the convulsive disorders that are untreated, the dementia um, grandmother who's lost in the barangay because cannot orient herself, go back home. It's really the chronic psychotic that has long been crazy but not treated. But who can be treated? The depressive, the anxious because has been left behind by a husband, etc. Very defined conditions. We can, when we go out there and tell them we can help you take care of these patients and therefore with simple medications, with simple advocacy to the mayor to put it in their own municipal budget because these medications can be, help, can be su suggested by the specialists among these cheaper medications. We have shown in our projects, and Leonor and I have been out there for her convulsive disorders and dementia, myself for the chronic mentally ill, for the chronic depressive suicidal, they do not need to take to call us because we are here in Manila. But they now, because of their own experiences, to see some uh, benefits, some improvements, that they start taking care of them. So the whole big challenge is really convincing the policy makers, decision makers, that okay, let's go. Then convincing the people that out there who are caregivers that help is being provided and can be provided to capacitate you to do that and a referral system will be worked out with the specialists. That's now part of that integrated, comprehensive okay. plan. Uh, it sounds good. You know, we're happy that we have the Mental Health Care Act and then we have Universal Health Care Act, but then how long, you know, in your opinion, how long will it take us to see the full um, implementation of this law? I, uh, the mental health gap actually uh, was, uh, I know that it was handed to the to OH in 2008, but started rolling late 2015. Mm -hmm. And then actually it's in the process now, but there's still a need for reorientation. And in fact, at least we're happy that the OH for the neurologic disorders, they gave us the imprimatur to modify the module because we're saying the module that was handed was not capacitating the primary care, but always ends up saying referring. Mm -hmm. So we have to catch up with those who need to be, uh, to have the education. In the medical schools, I think that this is where CHED is important. At least in the university, we have been teaching already our medical students the basic and uh, telling them when you go out there, you can take care of this for, for years, no? And so we are proud that our graduates can do that. Uh, but uh, the bill provides for neurology and psychiatry to be included in the medical curriculum and other uh, allied health courses and even postgraduate courses, yeah. Psychiatry and neurology, so. Uh, the, I, the, in the IRR, uh, there was a deadline for the different agencies, like I think most of the agencies were given maximum of two years to come up with the guidelines, but I think uh, DOH is already go working into it. There is already actually a mental health access program committee where they're identifying the medicines that should be given in, 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 the, in the primary care. So if you ask me how long will it take, I hope within the next five years, but... <laughs> because the challenges you mentioned are, one, uh, we need to, for the health, res the human resources. Yes, we have yes. to, the capability building that should happen. Yes. And I'm hoping that it will align with the universal health care, yes. wherein the primary care provider will also be equipped to yes. do this. Funding seems not to have to be a problem because we have the universal health care. I, I think that's so, my understanding. Yeah, yeah. Plus, uh, the local government units are being uh, encouraged to, to put some money. But, but what are the other challenges right now? I mean, we, it seems like we know the problem about human resources. We know about the issue on funding uh, and the local government. What are the other challenges that we have to deal with? Quite honestly, from my vantage point, as we sit in the Philippine Council for Mental Health, the challenge I feel is to really 
get our colleagues, the leaders out there in the council, in fact, and allow me to say this, to get kind of reorientation to the whole concept of mental health, the whole issue of the nature of mental disorders that have to be attended to, and the strategies for these kinds of implementation. Because at the moment, I think it is fair to say that the concept is still very traditional. So what is, the, what is your proposed concept? That, that we just do not address the issues of the clinics, the, the clinical view. Because when everybody talks mental health, you're ordinarily talking mental illness. So when you're looking for the policy maker, the decision maker there, they'll have, they will start looking at what do we do for them. I, I want to st have a step back and really say, what are you doing now that provides and promotes mental health and well-being in every person? So it becomes a generalist view. What does it mean for you to feel well? What does it mean for you to feel healthy? As I said, you have to have the four dimensions in your own life as a human being. You have physical health mental health, social health, and really, I will dare say, a spiritual health. You know? Especially in disaster victims, you get into that very, very strongly. When all else fails, your house is down, your three of your people dead, your livelihood is down, you just go back to your own self and say, okay, what else can I do? See? But that is the kind of message that probably it's picking up now when we're talking about promotion, mental health, promotion, well-being, look at definition of health, not just from the physical point of view, but your mind, your social relationships, your relationship with your supreme being. That's health. And anybody can really come up with programs within the context of their own institutions or agencies that addresses the bigger number of the people under their administration or under their care. The Department of Education, the Department of Local Government, the Department of Social Services, and we're doing it now global. So yeah, uh, the, the, actually, the clinical what, thing what, is leave it us to the specialists. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Actually, mental health is within the framework of UHC. And I, I know it is clear from the point of view of government that it includes mental health. And, th and that includes the spectrum of wellness. At yes, the, at the yes. End. And that okay, is so why all this, all this na, uh, what do you call NGA, uh, government agencies, uh, are actually mandated to look at it from a comprehensive perspective, like, like making the workplace a conducive environment, being nurturing, values formation in school, and all this. I, in fact, I was telling myself, Supposedly, for op optimal brain health, you should clear th cl I know, think clearly and make the right decisions. I was even telling myself, wow, isn't it right if the Filipino can make the right decision to vote for the right people? <laughs> so, <that you're laughs> so, for example, um, disasters, disasters, for example, we hear so much about resilience. We would like to have a resilient barangay. So we talk about resiliency of humans and resiliency at the level of barangay. Resilience is a very generic term. Yes. And looking at the mental health aspect of resilience, this is where the mental, the, the law would really be very much applicable. Dr. Lulu, Dr. Leonor, can you say, can you link resilience and uh, mental health? Yes. yes. Of course. You can't have mental health without your basic resiliency. So everything is I about mean, everybody, everybody resiliency. can, can okay. really have resilience. Coping is what you do when something happens. But each one of us, given a crisis, we, we do something. We stand up, we talk to someone, we re ease ourselves depending on the gravity of the situation, but we have a way of easing ourselves. So that That's is now the context of uh, the law from the tertiary clinical view or the lens to the barangay level, resilience in the community. If you talk about community resiliency, I've worked with them, marabot, some are down the ground, etc., etc., etc. And we have a program for that. You need to just look at this group of people 
who have themselves had their lives in there, allow for them to call upon themselves at some point. Of course, help them not fall victim to dependency of foreign people. But I have faith in the fact that when I see them, they know what to do. They just need help from the outside in the beginning so that they can rise above the rubble. But when they do, they can execute depending again on the conditions that they have. But you must grant everyone the nature of resiliency. To me, it's a natural gift to be resilient. So you don't develop resiliency, you have it. So in the context of community preparedness during disasters, natural and man-made, it is very important for the local government unit also to have a full understanding. So you think as a um, mental health uh, experts and advocates, with, you think it is important that the local government unit has a program for resiliency from the mayor to the barangay level. Is there a program already the for local government? The barangays have their programs to sustain their lives. They have. To sustain what they have, empower they have themselves to all do. Our barangays they have health, they have social welfare, they have labor, they have sports, they have neighborliness. I, I, I go out there and I really truly have faith in the Filipino sense of neighborliness. That's where it is. In our mental health program, all we did was really ident in the barangay because part of our mental health program is not just taking care of those with the mental health problem. It really was helping mental health concepts pervade the community development upon rehabilitation from disaster work. So what we had done with the help of a community development specialist, we have a social worker who has done that, is really work with the barangay there, okay. whoever they have entrusted and whoever they can tell us what they can do given the loss of livelihood, given the death that has happened, given the need for relocation of housing, choosing for alternative. They had that, and all we needed was really facilitate their development of their own sense of empowerment. And I guess mental health continues to give you that faith that you can do something. But Dr. Lulu and Dr. Yonor, are, are we together in uh, saying the laymanized thinking about the stigma attached to mental health patients is always sending the patient to the Philippine Center for Mental Health. It is existing, and how do we address this I don't, stigma? I don't even this? bother with stigma. Okay. I just tell them, hey, look, you have a depression, let's do but something about it. that's the problem of the community, yeah. and uh, they don't like the stigma too, but they're stigmatized. They're marginalized because of their mental health condition. But that's where your work in the community, our work in Samar and Iloilo, had gone to the barangay health workers. They are our allies to help out those who are hiding and are stigmatized oh, so that, that to would come be out. The strategy is now for First, the capacity you know, building. Capacity building. Uh, I, yes. I believe because the law provides uh, mental health education at all levels of our educational system and the workplace, that this is going to go a long way. Because I think even in the workplace, the reason they are afraid to hire them is because of ignorance, of yes. thinking that they cannot handle these patients. But once you overcome that barrier and they are aware and they have the knowledge, I think it goes a long way. And you need enough knowledge later on to go into advocacy. So the, your role in the Department of Education is very crucial. <laughs> the Department of Education? <laughs> From and, childhood and to adult. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is good because what we're saying now is that um, we really want to focus on wellness as part of the whole concept of the Mental Health Care Act. Yeah. So we want to take care of the well, the well is what you're so saying, so that they don't go slide down, down, slide down into the uh, either recognizable the mental, the, conditions, yes, uh, yeah. the, the mental conditions or the complications of your neurologic disorders. And I'm hearing that we have the ingredients at the level of the community and it, we only have to scale it up. Yes. I, I, am I getting that message? That, um, but how many of our barangays would have this capacity? <laughs> but, I mean, because I, I think it's good that uh, we yeah. have some models, but then 
we really have to scale it up where in all of them will have this capacity of uh, taking care of the people well, so how far are we off the, the of course at the moment we're talking about what's on paper Okay. Uh, some of us have already been out there in specific projects and have gotten passionate to believe that it can be done. Now, the challenge at the Philippine Council for Mental Health, where the Department of Local Government is part of this whole thing, is to roll down there with the help of specialists. The other thing I want to really say is the, the structure of the Philippine Council for Mental Health, which is going to implement this, is the fact that it's multi-sectoral. The specialists are us in the civil society group, the professional group, the non-government group, and the academe. The rest of the six members are coming from the, the crucial members of the uh, government, Department of Education, Department of Labor, Department of Local Governments, Commission on Human Rights, uh, Chair Dole. and Dole. Uh, uh, therefore, the message is, because we're talking about the other uh, major aspect of the program, which is wellness, promotion of mental health, this is now therefore the implementation of that multi-sectoral network. And the message is therefore mental health that used to be traditionally only looked at as the responsibility of a specialty group, that's us, the psychiatrists, cannot therefore now be just there. The psychiatrists are nowhere to be found. There are only how many of us in this country, you see? But the whole big thing that I'm trying to emphasize is really the multi-sectoral involvement at policy making down the delivery of services along which is capacity building and the research that's needed to find the services. Well, this gives me a lot of hope. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. You know, I, no. I, I look at the future generation to be luckier yeah. because probably we'll have a healthier community. The schools probably will have the mechanism to cope with uh, these problems. But, uh, and, and, you know, we're happy that the Mental Health Care Act and the Universal Health Care Act, they're both here to, to make this as a reality. But, you know, as um, it's, uh, the time is, uh, is up again, so yeah, but we'd uh, like to give some time for both of our uh, resource speakers to probably have a parting message to our viewers. Uh, we are very happy that uh, the Mental Health Act was passed and actually uh, it is very opportune that it actually came ahead of the universal health care. But we as uh, health care providers are also very happy with the Universal Health Care Act because we want equity for health care for everybody. But of course, we understand the role of us also in the academe in, and, and, also in the, and also as just Filipinos who want to take care for a better Philippines. Thank you very much. And I, I, I want to... Uh, and join everybody to support this aspect, especially. I'm very happy that the neuro neurology community is united and has committed to supporting this. Thank you very much. Dr. Lulu, party message? You know, as a psychiatrist, it's really good to feel the support. <laughs> We've always been out there in the periphery. Kinakatakutan pa nga kami, di ba? Ikinahihiya pa nga kami. But right now, we're on the forefront. And um, when I took my oath as member of the council, the Secretary of Health was really saying, oh, now it's your time to do something. <laughs> so sabi ko, that's a formidable challenge, but the, the content of the law is what we had felt should be there. In fact, a little pioneering over the other countries because we have included our colleagues in the neuroscience field, neurology, emphasizing the fact that science, psychiatry too, is a science, you know. It's not just something hanging around you there na, 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 na lang. But really, uh, it also involves a multi-sectoral involvement so that there is a, a publication called the Lancet Commission on Mental Health that really says mental health is now everybody's business because mental health is something everybody should have. So we thank you for inviting us here to share our thoughts and we look forward to really hard days ahead because we still have to get our feet going 
uh, the strategic plan for the Philippine Council for Mental Health is still being finalized. And I'm sure that that will again go through a lot of reviews, but the good thing is it is going. It is moving at its own schedule. We, we finished the IRR in six months' time, which everybody said, wow, mga obsessive compulsive sila doon, tapos ka agad, you know. But the IRR is there. The Philippine Council is now activated. And we, of course, need to advocate some more with the, the people and the, our colleagues in the policy-making body to really get us the budget. That the other thing, pie. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Mental health is everybody's business. business. <laughs> yeah. What a stimulating discussion we've had today about mental health, and I'm sure that our viewers have learned a lot, as Dr. Lidi and I did. We have to say goodbye, though, but promise to be back again for another KK episode. Thank you for watching and listening. I hope we'll still have you for our next episode. Dr. Lulu and Dr. Yonor, goodbye at mabuhay ang kalusugan ay karapatan. Music